Okay. Thank you for coming. <laughs> Thank you for the invitation. Uh, um, I know it's right after lunch. I also know that uh, it's a kind of a diverse audience, so, uh, and it's also a big room, so, but don't feel shy about raising your hand and asking questions because uh, my, my subject is a little bit off topic, but uh, there are some random matrices hiding in there. Let's see if you can find them. <laughs> All right, this is gonna be joint work with uh, Yan De Heer uh, from Melbourne and Sam Watson, who's at Brown. Uh, and um, it's a StatMec model. And uh, let me just start with the, what you might say is the sort of granddaddy of all StatMec models, which is the granddaddy in the sense of it's one of the oldest ones, and, but also very simple and still uh, not uh, solved in, in, in full generality. So this is the six vertex model, or square ice model, if you like. So it's, you consider the, the, the grid, square grid here in two dimensions. And I'm just gonna direct each arrow, direct each edge by putting an arrow on it, left or right for the horizontal and up or down for the verticals. And the rule is that at each vertex, I wanna have two incoming arrows and two outgoing arrows. All right, it's a very simple rule. And uh, then, uh, my, so my basic configurations is uh, a finite piece of this uh, graph with these arrow configurations on it. It's a finite space of conf configurations, and I'm going to put a measure on that space. The measure is giving a configuration a weight, uh, a probability proportional to, the, to its weight, which is the product over all the different uh, local types of vertices of some weight. For example, if you look at all, there's sort of six different local configurations at a given vertex, four choose two, if you think about the different ways that outgoing arrows can point, right? So there's two outgoing arrows uh, from each vertex, there's six possible configurations locally, and we give them weights A1 through A6, and when you have a big configuration like this, you, you look at all the vertices of type A1, all the vertices of type A2, and, and so on, and the weight of that configuration is A1 to the number of vertices of type A1, and so on. And then you turn that into a probability measure by uh, dividing, by, dividing by some normalizing constant uh, to get a probability measure on this finite state space. Okay, so it's a very simple model. Uh, why do we really care about this model? Uh, that's you know another question. Uh, in some sense, it's a well, it is a very simple model, and uh, it's called the square ice model. If you put all the weights equal to each other, you can think of each. Uh, uh, vertex as being like a, ha having an oxygen molecule and the arrows are pointing, t uh, the, the near, the arrows pointing in are like two hydrogen molecules, hydrogen atoms, oxygen atom and two hydrogen atoms. Uh, so, you know, there's some version of square ice and, you know, everybody's interested in ice, especially on a hot day like this, so why not study this model, okay? What, uh, uh, what kind of questions are we gonna ask well, uh, well, lots of questions. If I have a particular finite piece with some particular boundary conditions, like suppose I want this square and all the arrows pointing up here and down there and left, well, left there and right there, you know, and I take a random configuration with respect to this measure, what does it look like inside? Right, those are the kind of questions uh, which we're gonna be considering. And, uh, Another question, um, uh, e even simpler question, is uh, if you put this model on a torus, suppose I have you know, periodic boundary conditions, then how many uh, uh, configurations are there, or rather, what's the uh, total weight of all configurations? That's, uh, the, so the log of that quantity is called the free energy, and this was computed actually uh, many years ago, 50 years ago, uh, by Lieb in, a certain spe in some special cases, the cases when the these two weights are equal, these two weights are equal, those two weights are equal. There's some three-dimensional sub-variety of the space of all weights. Okay, a any questions about the model? Now's your chance, because it's the beginning of the lecture. <laughs> Don't be shy. <laughs> oh, uh, another case which, which uh, yeah, oh, yes, please. Oh yeah, okay. Um, 
you have a finite graph and you count, so the weight, so the probability of a configuration is one over a constant times A1 to the number of, a, uh, t of local vertices, lo vertices of type A1 times A2 to the NA2 up to A6 to the NA6, right? Where NA1 is the number of vertices of type, uh, the first type listed above there. Does that answer your question? And the, the free energy is essentially the log of this quantity Z here, this normalizing constant, the sum over all configurations of their weight. Okay, another, another case which has been solved is this free, so-called free fermion case, and I won't explain why we use that terminology, but uh, it's another subspace of the set of all weights for which there are explicit solutions using determinants and linear algebra, okay? Uh, okay, so um, another way to think about this model, by the way, is, is down here. If, if, uh, if I erase all the arrows which are pointing downward or pointing uh, to the left, then I get uh, the local configurations look like this, and I can think of my model as a sequence of uh, lattice paths, which, uh, on the lattice, which uh, sort of are north, northeast going or, or up, and, up and to the right, which are disjoint except that uh, they, can, uh, they can sort of bump into each other because there's this special weight A2, okay? So that's just another way to, to uh, represent the model in a, in a different point of view. All right, so what we, uh, so unfortunately we can't, we still can't do that full, the model in full generality, but we are gonna consider a different five-dimensional subset, subspace, subvariety of the space of all weights, uh, which, which we called, you know, quite unimaginatively the five-vertex model, but uh, it's a special case of the six-vertex model, and it's a generalization of another model which uh, which is an example, which is a special case of the free fermion model, but uh, um, a model which has been talked about already, the Lausenschilling model. So what is our model? Uh, you just take, here are the six possible configurations again, and we're just gonna throw this one away by giving it weight zero. Okay, so the paths are not allowed to uh, bump into each other anymore. But other than, other than that, that's the only uh, restriction so I have a five-dimensional space of weights, but uh, uh, if I scale all the weights by a constant, the measure doesn't change. So I'm, I, I can be free to set the first weight here to be one um, without loss of generality. And uh, there's another uh, hidden symmetry here, which is uh, these two weights. Well, if you think about it in terms of the lattice path, every time you, you turn right, you're gonna to have to turn left eventually, so you can pair up the left turns and the right turns, and so it doesn't hurt to give these last two configurations the same weight. So even though it looks like it has five different parameters, in, in reality there's only three parameters, which I call, and, and I chose this weight to be e to the x, that one e to the y, and the last one to be, well, r times e to the x plus y over two, the, the last two. So there's three parameters, x, y, and r left, left over. And, uh, Right, so I'm just repeating what I, the definition. A configuration has a certain probability, one over z times the, well, r to the, r to the c, where c is the number of corners, but now uh, e to the vx plus hy, where v is the number of vertical edges. So if you notice how I defined it, uh, this configuration gets an e to the x, and that one gets an e to the x over two. So uh, the net uh, number of x's there are, well, I get one e to the x for every vertical edge in the model, and one e to the y for every horizontal edge. And, and you know, so here's a, here's a simulation uh, of the case, uh, well, when x and y are zero and r equals one. In this case, uh, uh, all, all five configurations are equally, all five local configurations are equally likely, okay? And that's with the toroidal boundary conditions. All right, well, what's the Lawson's tiling model? It's this model uh, of random tilings with these three types of tiles, the red, the green, and the blue. And he, here's a little simulation of the Lawson's tiling model. Just think about the, 
for example, the uniform weight on all possible tilings of a torus with these three kinds of tiles. And you can see that actually these models are, you know, quite similar. In fact, they're exactly the same when, the, when that quantity R is one. Uh, uh, you can think about the, the, these chains formed from blue and green lozenges, and they, they look just like these uh, lattice paths here, the northeast lattice paths. They don't intersect each other, and uh, so on. And, uh, well, that's the R equals one case. Remember, R is the last, the, the weight per corner here, right? R is, R is kind of counting the number of corners. And so uh, if you want, if you're, if you're familiar with the lozenge tiling model, then you can think of the R not equal to one case as sort of an interacting lozenge tiling models where every uh, blue lozenge, every time you have a blue and a green lozenge adjacent to each other, you get an extra factor of R, okay? So if R is less than one, then you want to have fewer corners so that the, these paths want to go straight. If R is bigger than one, you want to have more corners. Okay, well, uh, these two parameters, X and Y, they, uh, well, if you're a physicist, they, they play what you call, the role of what you call a magnetic field. Uh, uh, right, if you, X is, is in some sense t telling you that your preference for going vertically and Y is your preference for going horizontally. If X is large, then configurations with lots of vertical edges will have large weight and therefore large probability. Similarly for Y. If X is small, then you're sort of dis, uh, you know, <laughs> you, you don't want to have lo lots of uh, vertical edges. So uh, as you vary X and Y, uh, what's going on in the model is you're varying the the number of uh, these lattice lines, right? When, when X, if X and Y are both large, then you want to have lots of lines going both vertically and horizontally. If they're both small, then you want to have very few lines. And if you go back to this, uh, this case here, uh, you know, most of, the, most of the picture here is red because I took X and Y to be small, uh, I mean, or negative, I, I should say, so that, uh, you know, these blue-green lines, they're not, they're not as frequent as they would be in the uniform model. Okay, so there's this uh, somewhat interesting relationship between these two parameters, X and Y, and the density of lines, which I'm calling, well, the density is determined by two real numbers, S and T. S is like the horizontal density of lines. It's the number of uh, lines per unit uh, segment horizontally, and T is the number of lines per unit segment vertically. Right, if you increase X, you increase S, if you increase y, you increase t. Right, does that make sense? Uh, but uh, this, it's only a, uh, there is sort of a one-to-one -one correspondence between x, y, and s, t, but the actual, you know, qu quantitative relationship between x, y, and s, t is not at all obvious. Right, if I double x, uh, you know, if I, if I add one to x, what happens to s? You know, it depends on everything else. So, uh, and so that is the fun, sort of fundamental relationship which we need to find because that will actually tell us the free, the, the quantity, the first, the most, mo most important quantity about the model, which is the free energy. In fact, there's a relationship between the free energy, I mean, the derivative of the free energy is a function of, of the weights, x, y, and r. I, I, r, you should think of a subscript r here. And the, the gradient, with respect to these x and y variables is, in fact, the s and t variables. So if I happen to know uh, what s and t corresponds to a particular value of x and y for a fixed r, then I would be able to integrate that to get f. Right, there's an there's a, there's a interesting sort of, well, uh, this is sort of a general relation for, for models of this type. Uh, once I know x and y, I can get, if I know the relationship between x, y, and s, t, I can get f. Conversely, if, if I know f, then I can get st from x and y by this but equation. Yeah. Yes. Uh, well, you can integrate up to a. Con you can get the. That's right. You need to f find at least one value somewhere. You're right. But uh, in some sense, we don't care about any uh, any single value. We care about the functional relationship uh, as x and y varies. Okay. So let's let me just tell you the answer in this case, the, the easy case, which is R equals one, right? That's just the uniform 
well, it's the Lawson's tiling case with these weights x and y, right? And here, the, there's a, a very simple relationship between x, y, and, S, uh, and st, but it's, I've said, simple and mysterious because it is mysterious. It's, and the relationship is the following. You take a triangle with edge lengths 1, e to the x, and e to the y, with three positive numbers, and you, lo you look at these two angles, and the two angles are s and t, uh, pi times s and pi times t. Right? Th that, uh, uh, well, like I said, it's mysterious. I, I don't have any, I can't prove that to you in, uh, in uh, five minutes or even 15 minutes, right? It would take uh, some time. Why it's so simple, I don't know. Uh, but, uh, you know, you can notice certain things, like if, if x is very large and y is not very large, then there is no such triangle. <laughs> right, you have to satisfy the triangle inequality. If x and y are too small, then what happens is this triangle sort of flattens out and s and t go to zero, which means you have no lattice pass at all. Okay, so you can, you can figure out various th interesting things just from this relationship. But, uh, you know, once you have that relationship, you know, it's just a matter of trigonometry or something to, to figure out the relationship between x, y, and s and t, and you can f compute f that way. f is this free energy. And in fact, uh, while I'm at it, S and T uh, naturally live in a triangle, right? The horizontal density goes from zero to one, and the vertical density goes from zero to one, but the, the sum of the two densities can't be larger than one because uh, you, know, you, can't, you can't fill up more than the lattice. They have to be disjoint. The, two, the lattice paths all have to be disjoint from each other, which makes that the S and T varies over this unit triangle. And in fact, the X and Y can be any real numbers in the whole plane, uh, but if X is too big, uh, then uh, this triangle sort of flattens out completely and you get a degenerate measure over here where s is 1 and t is 0. That's, so this entire region over here maps under this gradient to that, to that vertex. And this region maps to there and, and this region maps to there. And, but but there's, a region, there's an interesting region in here in this uh, amoeba shape that maps to sort of injectively onto the interior of the triangle. So that's this nice uh, relationship. That's, in, that's the, the case r equals 1. Right? And part of the goal of the talk is to at least explain what the relationship is when r is not equal to 1. It's, it's some generalization of this fact. Okay, all right. are we good so far? Uh, while I'm at it, uh, this is still in the case r equals 1, right? The, there, was, there was these other two, well, let me go back one slide, right? Uh, Given x and y, I can tell you s and t that it's an invertible uh, map, and the inverse is also the gradient of some function sigma called the surface tension that is essentially measuring uh, how much this, the, the, you know, if you think of this uh, lawsons Childing model as a surface in R3, uh, it, uh, it has a certain, the, the growth rate of the number of surfaces as a function of the slope, so s and t is like the slope of that surface in R3, the growth rate as a function of the slope is this number sigma, is this quantity sigma. Okay, and you know, if you, if you do that integral, which Girard asked about, and you happen to know the value somewhere like on the boundary, then, <laughs> then you can compute it everywhere, and well, there it is. The, the, the funny thing is, or the interesting thing is, that that integral is, does not give you some elementary function. It involves a uh, dialog some, some variant of the dialogarithm function, if you know what that is. But anyway, there's a plot of that function on the, so it's a function, here it's a function of s and t, which gives you the, the surface tension as a function of s and t. It's a nice concave function. And you can see that it's sort of minimized at one-third comma one-third. That's the uniform, uniform measure. Uniform measure is the, the one where the growth rate is largest. And therefore, the surface tension is the, Minimal, because that's that's where the that's where the system is happiest is being in the one third one third one third uh, slope. Okay, so let, but now let's go to the general case, the case of general R. Uh, and uh, right, so the question, the fundamental question is, how do we find the free energy, right? And unlike the Lawson's case, we don't have nice determinantal formulas. I didn't tell you about how to do the Lawson's Stanley case, but uh, uh, it's much easier than this one. <laughs> the, 
there's no determinant formulas, but we need, but, but the, we can go back to Lieb's method, which is in fact older than uh, his work, but uh, goes back to, I guess, Hans Bethe, uh, the Bethe Ansatz. And so what we're going to do is uh, put the model on a cylinder. Maybe I'll draw a picture. So think about a square grid on a cylinder, on an infinite cylinder like that, of circumference, you know, n. And um, sort of a bi-infinite cylinder. And <coughs> we're, we're just interested in counting. We're summing the weights of all configurations. So we're going to define a matrix which tells us, given a configuration on a given row, uh, how many configurations does it give, give, give rise to on the next row? So our matrix is going to be indexed by configurations on a given row. So there's this matrix T called the transfer matrix. And if our circumference is n, oops, we got too hot. <laughs> if our circumference is n, the, the, then, you know, uh, if you think about what a configuration looks like, it has some paths coming in, and uh, at the next row up here, it's going to have some paths coming out, which are connected like this. Right, so the, the states of the transfer matrix, the state of the transfer matrix is a, is a configuration on this row. So it's a subset of uh, vertical edges on a given row. So T, this matrix T, is a, is a 2 to the n by 2 to the n matrix uh, indexed by all possible configurations on a given row. And the entries are just the, you know, if I, if I have a given configuration on this row and a given configuration on this row, I need to know if, if they are connected or not. And if they are connected, what's the weight of uh, the internal weight of the vertices involving that connection? Those, those are the entries in the matrix T. And, uh, you know, so, so wh what's the point of T is that, uh, you know, if you take powers of T, this counts the number of configurations starting at a given, if I start at some initial configurations, you know, E, E, I, and E, J, this is the number of configurations, the total weight of configurations starting in state I here and ending N, n layers of, uh, higher in state J. Right, so the, the whole, the, the goal of, to compute the free energy, it suffices to, to, you know, understand the powers of T, and in particular, all we need is the leading eigenvector of T. So, so we've reduced the problem, yes? We've reduced the problem to a linear algebra problem. We have this matrix, find the largest eigenvector and eigenvalue, find the, well, we need both the eigenvector and the eigenvalue, but, you know, the free energy is just given by the leading eigenvector, I'm oh, sorry, eigenvalue of this matrix. Okay, how are we doing? It's coming up. <laughs> well, uh, we're, we're, it's, we're, you should not be happy yet, you shouldn't be jumping up and down yet, because it's a two to the n by two to the n matrix, right, that's it's pretty, pretty large, right? even when n is 10. Uh, <laughs> uh, and we're interested in the case when n is large. Well, there, there's a sort of a partial diagonalization of this matrix uh, into blocks, right? T is the big matrix, but uh, there are, in fact, uh, blocks according to the number of particles, uh, the number of paths, right? In this case, if there are three paths coming in on one layer, then there has to be three paths coming out on the next layer. So there's this, uh, uh, for each, K, where K is the number of particles, there's a submatrix, uh, an invariant subspace, uh, uh, and let's call TK the matrix on that subspace. So TK is the transfer matrix for K particles, and it's only n choose K by n choose K. Okay, so that's a slight improvement. But the, the key observation of uh, beta uh, is that, uh, well, uh, there's an explicit form for the eigenvectors for all these matrices, for all these little matrices. And so, so let me just run through this briefly in some small cases, like T1. What is T1? T1 means there's one particle. So if you have one particle coming in and one particle coming out, uh, well, the graph has this, this, the matrix has this circular symmetry because the, the cylinder has the circular symmetry, and uh, which means that the eigenvector uh, it ha it's a circulant matrix. The eigenvectors have to be, uh, you know, uh, 
exponentials, e to the i 2 pi j over n, where n is the circumference. And if you know the eigenvectors, it's easy to compute the eigenvalue. Okay, so for the one by one matrix, it's, a, it's a completely trivial to diagonalize that matrix. But for the two by two matrix, it's already uh, much harder. But uh, the kind of amazing fact is that the eigenvectors, uh, uh, but this formula kind of generalizes. The eigenvectors had this nice form as uh, a sum of two exponentials. Here, if, if, if you, this is a, my eigenvector, which has two parameters, zeta one and zeta two, and x one and x two are the positions of the particles coming on, on a given row. So this is x one, that's x two, and this is uh, yeah, the, out, the, out, the output. And as a function of x one and x two, the eigenvector looks like this. It's some constant, zeta one to the x one, zeta two to the x two, plus another constant, zeta one to the x two, zeta two to the x one. You just switch, switch x one and x two. Um, well, maybe I will skip the reason that, the reason we should expect that, uh, something of that form. Uh, well, it's basically the fact that uh, your, the, the state space is, is like a vial chamber. Uh, you know, you have this set of pairs x, x1, x2, where x1 is less than x2, and you're, so you're, you can think of it as a random walk on some higher dimensional, some higher dimensional, tr you know, triangle. Uh, anyway, but the, the, the fact is that for Tk, when you have k particles, the, this formula generalizes, uh, and the eigenvectors always have this nice form, uh, well, nice in quotes, right? Uh, it's still kind of complicated. It's a sum of a bunch of, wave of exponentials. But in this case, there's k factorial different exponentials, which uh, it's, it's, it's maybe convenient to write it in this form. You have this matrix, uh, this sort of Vandermond-like matrix, where the entries are zeta i to the xj. And then we have this thing, which is not a determinant, even though it looks like it's a determinant sub a. Well, the, because these coefficients here, uh, when you sum over the symmetric group, the coefficients are not just minus one to the signature. Uh, they're not just the signature of the permutation. They're some, more comp some other function on the permutation group. So think of a pi as some arbitrary function on sk, and then uh, you, when you make this sum, let's define that to be determinant sub a. Okay, so that's the, that's the form of the general eigenvectors for tk, for any k. Right, and of course, if a pi happened to be something nice, like minus one to the pi, then this would be an actual determinant and, and we'd be, you know, in business. But it's not. Um, uh, yeah, well, we'll get there. <laughs> it's not, but uh, there's some manipulation you can do to make it look like a determinant. Okay, what about these, these uh, uh, what about these constants? So I have to tell you what a, the a's are and also the zetas. And it turns out that the zetas uh, satisfy some nice equations. Well, nice uh, is in the eye of the beholder here. These, these, these zetas are called beta roots and they satisfy a certain system of polynomial equations. Mm, right, there's uh, here are, we're on the n by n space, little n, uh, and so there's n of there's little n of these zeta i's, and they satisfy this well nasty actually looking uh, system of polynomial equations, rational equations. But here's where the the six vertex model and the five vertex model differ, because in the five vertex model, uh, here I wrote down the equation for the five vertex model, and you see in the denominator here there there's no j. This is a product over j. There's no j in the denominator, so I can take this, this denominator and just scoot it over to the other side, and then I get a function of i over here and a product over all the j's of some polynomial there. And let me, probably this is not important, this is going too fast, but let me just redefine these new numbers, w sub j, these are complex numbers, which are just scaled versions of the zetas, the beta roots, and then, then you have to, then you know, the equation looks, looks like this. When you move this denominator over, it looks, it simplifies, right? So here we get an interesting polynomial, wi to some power, one minus wi to some power equals this thing. And this, so here's the interesting observation. This is a product over all the roots that we care about. And in particular, it's a symmetric function of all the wj, so we might as well think of that as a constant which depends on, on our parameters x, y, and r. Oops. 
for example, uh, you know, suppose my two constants were 12 and 4, then I, I essentially, to get the roots, these beta roots, I just need to solve some polynom a single polynomial equation. W to some power, 1 minus W to some power equals constant. So these uh, roots uh, turn out to lie on some nice friendly curves in the plane called Cassini ovals. Cassini ovals are, uh, they're the locus of points whose, such that the sum of the logs of the distances to 1 and 0 is a, is a constant, like 1. So it's kind of like an ellipse. You know, an ellipse has a property that you sum the distances to two points and you, is a constant. Here, you sum the logs of the distance to, a point, to two points and you get a Cassini oval. All right, and they look like that. So th this, these are, the red, blue, and green here are three different Cassini ovals with the same uh, ratio of alpha over beta, the, the coefficients here. And so, you know, you should think of this, these two numbers, 12 and 4, as being very large, because we want large, in, in, this, in, the, in the limit of large system size, uh, these two things, these two exponents are going to go to infinity, but their ratio is going to be constant. The ratio depends on the, the density, the horizontal density or something like that. Okay, so, you know, think, think of, as these things get large, the, the, the curves are not going to change, it's just that the roots are going to become more and more dense on these curves. And, and this constant is a function of our input parameters, x, y, and r. And you can see something interesting happening that, you know, when, when this constant is small, there's two ovals. And when it's large, there's one oval. They sort of, they sort of uh, merge. And in fact, there's one, there's one case, which is uh, that curve. Who knows what that curve is called? It's called, a, well, it's a lemnus gate. The lemnus gate is actually the, the symmetric version, but uh, I guess you can call it a generalized lemnus gate. It's one of those classical algebraic geometry curves. There's no clock in here. How much time is there? What? Okay, thanks. Okay. So, oh yeah, there's an orange line. <laughs> what is that orange line? Well, uh, when these two numbers get 12 and 4 get large, uh, this, the, the, you know, the sum of the two, these two numbers is capital N, the system size, and the smaller number is the, is the, is the little n, it's the number of paths. And that orange line separates the, the, the little n roots from the rest of the roots. So the roots we care about are the ones that are near 1 here. And, and Notice that when this constant is small, there's exactly four roots, the, the little n roots on this guy, and all the other roots are on that guy. But when, when it gets larger, so this orange line separates the, the little n roots from all the big n roots there. The, the roots we really, we really care about are the ones on that side of the line. Okay, and well, I might as well just, sh just show it up, sh put it up here. <laughs> The leading eigenvalue is some function of these, of these 